Well, Dr. Stan, here at the Genesis Communication Network, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Western and Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion and delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, and supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views. And, well, for the next half hour, the next hour, they're going to be views of our good friend, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who's taught at the university level, who certainly was in the Reagan uh, Department of Education, who's been a consultant for industry, he's a prolific writer. But Dennis, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, we'll pick up on uh, my series, so uh, will Israel uh, attack Iran? Uh, but as usual, I try and give a couple of comments about things that are uh, current, uh, although the will Israel attack Iran is certainly a current subject. And the first thing, since uh, a lot of people listening uh, today, uh, I haven't uh, talked to them much in the past. I just wanted to remind them that I'll have a new book out uh, pretty soon. It'll be titled The Power Elite with a subtitle, Their History and Future. But in the meantime, the current book, which I have uh, had published, is uh, called The uh, Paralete and the Secret Nazi Plan. And I just remind uh, the listeners that uh, all they have to do, if they don't have uh, sufficient funds, is to ask their local library, their local public library, to order the book so that the uh, you know, the listeners can read it. But it's important to uh, to do that. Uh, because we, we really need to get the word out because the secret Nazi plan is coming to fulfillment uh, today. And uh, another item of uh, current interest in the news uh, have been the various scandals within the uh, Obama administration. And uh, one of them, in particular, the uh, National Security Agency and is listening and to various, um, well, they, they would say they haven't listened, but uh, they're just identifying phone numbers, and they then are able to uh, link the names uh, of the people with those phone numbers to the calls and then get a warrant and so forth if they need to actually listen to a to a call. Uh, but the, the first thing that I think is curious about that is that even Osama bin Laden uh, many years ago, uh, would not even use a cell phone because he knew that uh, the NSA was listening in. So only the most uh, ignorant of uh, terrorists is going to do that sort of thing anyway. But uh, it did make me remember uh, back around 1967 when uh, Dr. Richard Day, he had been addressing a uh, conference of pediatricians in Pittsburgh. And uh, actually, Radio Liberty has the transcript and the tapes of an interview which would say uh, Dr. Dunnigan, Lawrence Dunnigan, is recounting because he was in attendance what Dr. Day had said. And I'm not going to go into all the, the details of what he said, but it was really uh, very, very detailed about what was going to happen in the future. It's sort of like um, a... a book called Lord of the World from 1907 by Robert Hugh Benson, uh, which literally was saying that there would be a communist uh, revolution in 1917, which was 10 years in the future at that time, and then the Western scheme of free trade in 1989, which was uh, 82 years in the future, and then by 1998, ministers of euthanasia, sort of like Jack of Orkin, and that was uh, 90. Uh, 91 years in the future, predicting uh, almost uh, to the exact date. And so what uh, Dr. Richard Day was explaining in 1967, of course, just about everything he detailed there has, uh, has come to pass. And I was thinking, well, why then? I mean, what, what did he know? And it, it reminded me uh, of the situation we have today with the NSA in that uh, critical to Big Brother is the, the knowledge of everything we're doing and everything we're saying. And so uh, I, what uh, your listeners might find interesting is in 1918, there was the first concept of a, a cell phone. 
Now, they didn't do a whole lot uh, with that until about 1956 when you had the first car phone, the first uh, phone that you could have in your car, which meant it wasn't limited to a landline. It, it wasn't like your phone on your desk in your, uh, in your room and a line would go outside and underground through a cable to, you know, all over the U.S. and even they had cables, fiber optic cables to you know, overseas and so forth. But it wasn't limited to that. So if by 1956 they had that ability, so you weren't limited to the landline, and then just a couple of years or so after that you had Sputnik, which was the first little satellite uh, the Soviets sent up, a little satellite. Uh, anybody in the intelligence business could have put those two things together. Uh, you're, you're basically non-landline uh, phone with satellites and figured out, even by then, the late 50s, that this was coming. Uh, the cell phone of the future, the cell phones that we have now, their abilities, was coming. So my guess is by 1967, uh, the powers that be and intelligence agencies uh, around the world pretty well knew what was going to happen. And that's why one of Dr. Day's statements uh, sort of stuck in my mind. Before he began his talk, he said, well, this time we're going to get it right, and, you know, there's no stopping it now. So by 67, he was one of these, I think, agents of the power elite, and he was privy to certain information, much like H.G. Wells was in the 1933 when he wrote his book, The Shape of Things to, uh, to Come, and he said in there that in six years, 1939, there'd be a Second World War and so forth and so on. And then in 1939, he wrote his book called The New World Order, and he said 50 years or so, uh, there would be a uh, what he called a world state. They would come out of a conference at Basra, Iraq. You know, not London, not Moscow, not New York, but Basra, Iraq. And of course, Iraq is uh, was very uh, important in this whole last couple of decades that we've been through. And so uh, these people are privy to this secret sort of knowledge uh, as to what the paralytes doing, what intelligence agencies are doing. And I suspect that by 1967, that's what he meant. He had found out as an agent of the paralyte what they had in store for us. And that's why he was able to very accurately predict a whole lot of things, just a whole lot of things. And uh, I think they knew at that time already what they were going to put this used uh, to in terms of cell phones, their abilities to monitor uh, with satellites, their abilities to do those two things together and to monitor not only where we were, every step we take, you know, every move we make, uh, with the capabilities of seeing from outer space you know, a license plate, they could identify a license plate from outer space, but also monitoring our, our conversations on phones. Well, and let, me just course, comment, let me just comment that we do have the a four CD set. It's called The New Order of the Barbarians. We have the transcript of it. And Dr. Day, a uh, medical director of Planned Parenthood, uh, basically said he was uh, speaking for the order. And the reason he was going willing to talk to the doctors about this in 1969 is there was no way to stop it. It was going to go through. I mean, it was far enough advanced that everything was in place. He talked about creating new diseases. That was 1969, and certainly the first cases of AIDS showed up in 1977. We didn't recognize it until 1981, but people were beginning to contract this strange new disease. He talked about uh, certainly all the things they were going to do, how certainly uh, the, the Japanese were going to produce better cars than we did. They were intentionally going to produce inferior cars here so they could begin to be shift automobile and other production to other countries. Everything was planned, and you can, if you read that document, which of course very few people have, but we have it and we've uh, duplicated it, why well, you find out that literally everything going on today was planned at that time, Karate had Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, including uh, terrorist attacks. He, he's uh, specific about that and, you know, attacks on buildings and bridges and, and lots of different things. And uh, now people would have uh, these sudden attacks, heart attacks, that they wouldn't be natural. They would be programmed and planned, and you could actually assassinate people that way. And I hear the music. You do, and we're going to be back here in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Kenny. But you must understand, I believe we're moving towards a climax of civilization. What an exciting time to be living. What an exciting time to know the Lord. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. Kenny right here at Genesis.
Well, this is Dr. Stan, our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy. He's talking about these uh, interviews we have with Dr. Dunnigan, who actually, in 1969, had heard Dr. Richard Day, who was the medical director of Planned Parenthood, lay the whole plan out, saying to the doctors he was addressing, in 1969, look, it's too late to change it. You can't take any notes or certainly record what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Well, Dr. Dedeke did take notes so that he would be able to recall this later on. And, and certainly uh, before he died, why I had a chance to talk to him. It's amazing how many of the people who come up and uh, understand what's going on and reveal what's going on die at an early death, but that's what happened to Dr. Dunnigan, and uh, we, but it's recorded in the four CD set, the New Order of the Barbarians, and of course there is a a uh, transcript of this. It's available, so you can read it and reread it, and really begin to get a grasp of what lies ahead. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd just touch on a few of the items in there, so you listeners would uh, know what uh, what the examples were. He. Um, uh, Dr. Day had been medical, national medical director of Planned Parenthood from 1965 to 68, and then the next year, March of 69, is when he was addressing this conference of uh, pediatricians in uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, he said, Every, quote, everything is in place and nobody can stop us now. This time, we're going to do it right. And then uh, he went on to say, talk about the following. He said, contraceptives, now remember, this is way back, so a lot of these things we're familiar with now, but at the time, uh, they were not uh, in, in place. So he was predicting the future. He said there would be contraceptives would be dispensed at schools. Abortion would become legal. And remember, 69, that's four years before Roe versus Wade. Abortion would become legal and paid for by tax dollars. Homosexuality would be promoted as no longer to be considered abnormal behavior. Hard to cure diseases would be created. Cures for nearly all cancers had been developed but were being hidden at the Rockefeller Institute so that the population would not increase. A hard-to-detect means had been developed for inducing heart attacks. That's an assassination. A drug and addiction would be promoted so the unfit would die. Euthanasia would be more accepted as the cost of medical care would intentionally be made burdensomely high. Think of that when you hear about uh, Obamacare's death panels. Uh, he also said divorce would be made easier. ID badges would become more prevalent, eventually implanted under the skin and perhaps transmitter and dental fillings. All salary payments and purchases would be conducted electronically by computer in one banking system. Major world religions, especially Christianity, would have to change into a new world religion, and the churches uh, would help uh, to bring it about. He also said uh, more airplanes and rail accidents would occur, as well as building and bridge collapses uh, would occur to create an atmosphere of instability. Terrorism would be used to make people demand international controls, you know, give up some of your freedom in order to have peace and security. And he said economic interdependence would help lessen national sovereignty as uh, people would become uh, citizens of the world. He uses, uh, used that term uh, as well, I believe. And so he, uh, he was very, very accurate about what was coming, and um, that's uh, something worth your uh, thinking about. Uh, now, uh, picking up on my series, Will Israel Attack Iran? Uh, previously, I had uh, been talking about uh, what would happen if a nation tried to buck the system? And I had uh, mentioned now uh, W.J. Gent, G-H-E-N-T, who was a, the editor of a magazine called The American Fabian, as in uh, you know Fabianism and Fabian Socialism, uh, which is a gradual uh, approach towards uh, implementing socialism within the nation. He had written a book called uh, Our Benevolent Feudalism, F-E-U-D-A-L, feudal, feudalism. And he was saying what would uh, it would be like in the future in this uh, feudal uh, system that they were, they were planning for our future. And 
that led us up to a uh, where I am in my series uh, talking about the fate of any individual, not just nation, but any individual who tried to uh, buck the system, as they say. And that was described in the same year in an article, not in the book, but in an article by W.J. Gent. And the, the newspaper was called The Independent. That was the name of the newspaper, the April 3rd, 1902 edition. And the article was titled The Next Step a benevolent feudalism. And in there, he described what would happen to individuals under this system to come in the future, which was planned for us. He said, uh, this is part of his quote, he said, group fidelity is already observable. The autocrats will distribute benefits to the degree that makes a tolerant, if not satisfied, people. In other words, people would, you know, become uh, tolerant. Or was, you may not be thrilled about it, but you would tolerate the change that was happening. And again, uh, goes on and says, a person of offensive activity may be denied work in every feudal shop and on every feudal farm from one end of the country to the other. His actions will be promptly communicated to the banded autocracy of dukes, earls, and marquises of industries. See, he's using the terms that they they used back many centuries ago when they talked about feudalism. There were dukes and earls, and you know a certain rank and status. And then at the bottom of it, you had the uh, the peasants, the serfs, the oafs, the knaves, and so on. In the in the feudal system, there was really no middle class at the time. And so Gent goes on and says the individual security of place and livelihood of its members will then depend on the harmony of their utterances and acts, A-C-T-S, acts, with the wishes of the great nobles. And so long as they rightly fulfill their functions, their recompense will be generous. You know, you go along with the system, you'll be uh, well provided for. And Gent goes on and he says, they will be at once the assuagers of popular suspicion and discontent and the providers of moral and intellectual anodynes for the barons. See, they'll, they'll, they'll psychologically manipulate you. You know, they'll have ways of dealing with people who are suspicious of what's going on. They'll soothe your, you know, ruffled feathers if you get agitated and so on. Uh, Gent goes on. He says, a host of economists... Preachers and editors will be ready to show indisputably that the evolution taking place is for the best interests of all. The nobles will have attained to complete power, and the motive and operation of government will have become simply the registering and administering of their collective will, see what they want, not what you want, not the public, not a government of by for the people, but what these uh, these elitists want. They, he calls them the nobles. Again, uh, continues, he says, armed force will, of course, be employed to overawe the, uh, the discontented and to quiet unnecessary turbulence. You know, they'll, they'll use force if they have to, in a, in a sort of benevolent, as gently as possible way. And then he goes on, again, goes on, he says, unlike the armed forces of the old feudalism, the nominal control will be that of the state. When the new order is in full swing, he says, so comprehensive and so exact will be the social and political control that it will be exercised in a constantly widening scope. I hear the music and we'll pick up after the break. All right, fine. Our guest, Dr. Dennis Kelly, ladies and gentlemen, everything taking place is planned and we're moving into the climax of history. And this is the uh, we carry Dr. Cuddy's books. All of them are in print. You can call our 800 number. We specifically recommend the Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. And ladies and gentlemen, the Secret Nazi Plan is still going. They 
would send their agents throughout the world following World War II with the full help and cooperation of the suddenly of British intelligence and American intelligence and a, a cell within the Vatican. In fact, this is last week why we find out that the new pope is talking about the fact that there is a gay cell or group working at the highest levels of the Vatican and he is somewhat concerned about the fact that there's a gay group working within that cardinals there in the Vatican. Ladies and gentlemen, they've infiltrated the Catholic Church, they've infiltrated the Protestant Church. Remember Ted Haggard? He was in charge of the, the president of the American Association of Evangelical Christians, a, 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 a certainly a, a cocaine-using homosexual in charge of all the evangelicals here in the United States. You can see how clever these people are. And then we wonder why we're in the trouble we are today. Well, but remember, you need to get Dr. Cuddy's book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. Dennis, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, they... Um... <clears throat> Uh, for for quite uh, quite some time, I remember he's deceased now. But there was uh, one uh, Dominican uh, priest uh, who used to be active in uh, exposing the New World Order and so forth uh, some time ago, and uh, he he was uh, really harassed by a lot of Dominicans in his um, in his order who were homosexual, and he was gathering information on them and sent them over to the Curia in uh, Rome. And lo and behold, they just turned around and sent him back to the head of his order. And so he caught caught blazes for that. And he just he just you know went to Atlanta, I think, and lived with his sister the the last days of his life. Uh, but he, he said the curia was full uh, full of homosexuals. And uh, I, I remember Bella Dodd when she wrote her book The School of Darkness in the early fifties. She had uh, sort of seen the light. Uh, she had started out as a Christian, but then she became a communist. And reached, I think, I think their title was like vice president of the Communist Party of America. And uh, but uh, by the early fifties, she had uh, sort of awakened, and uh, she was testifying before the House on American Activities Committee. And one of the things that uh, struck me was uh, not only that uh, she said uh, she had thought it was interesting that the same people, and she said we didn't, she, the top level of the Communist Party did not spread this around, but she thought it was of great interest that the same people that were funding them had been funding uh, the Nazis. And she also uh, told uh, individuals that back in the 30s, they had, uh, the communists that she was with at the time, had successfully placed, I think it was about 1,100 uh, seminarians. Uh, these would be young people, seminarians, who would be become priests. Uh, and they were really undercover communists and for just this type of purpose, that they would wait and buy their time to become monsignors and bishops and cardinals and, and so forth. And therefore, uh, when they was in you know, 20, 30 years down the road, they had reached uh, positions of power. Not only could they control things within the Catholic Church, but through various you know, homosexual activities, they could uh, bankrupt, basically bankrupt the church, uh, because, you know, obviously when it was exposed, there'd be these lawsuits, and they have been. So there, a lot of this has to do with the infiltration uh, of, the, uh, of the Catholic Church, and uh, uh, the the uh, the secret Nazi plan book uh, that uh, that I have out is is important now. Uh, what Dr. Stan just said about uh, Ted Haggard, uh, the same sort of thing is true under the secret Nazi plan. You would have somebody like an SS officer named Paul Dickoff going underground early on in the the war, at least in terms of Americans uh, America's role in 1941-42. And uh, working with Alan Dulles of the OSS, which become the CIA, and Alan Dulles, of course, would head the CIA under Eisenhower in the 1950s. But after the war and through the secret Nazi plan in 1968, uh, strategically placed would be a person like Paul Dickoff. And where was he placed? Just like Ted Haggard being head of the evangelicals, uh, this fellow became head of Interpol. And that was an extremely important position for a Nazi to be in, head of Interpol for four years, 68 to 72, when he died. Because as head of Interpol, you know everything. I mean, you have the global computer access of criminals and what they're doing and not doing and where they are and everything. So that was a, a very strategically important position for him to be in. Now, 
there, I just want to make a note of this in case some of your listeners happen to know people like this. Uh, a lot of my books have, have sold, in fact, all my books have pretty much sold out. And they'll, they'll have or maybe not have a second or a third run of the books. There are uh, very, very, pro- I'm not going to name the groups. There are very, very prominent, some two or three very prominent groups, though, who are not into this book, this book, The, the Secret Nazi Plan. And their reasoning, I think, is fallacious, and I just want to touch on this very, very briefly. The the attitude was, and the way the power elite, which is controlled both the communists and the Nazis, and they control our presidents or puppets of theirs, is that they play one side against each another. So when the Nazis were uh, doing their thing and rising to power in the 30s with the uh, assistance of the, the power elite, and our, our American corporations, about 150 or so major corporations, uh, was uh, helping fund them and make manufacture things for them. They were presented as a, a, a force against the uh, communists. That's the way they were presented in the 30s. Well, yes, yes, we are contributing to the, the Nazis and Hillary, but you have to understand they're a great force against the communists. Well, the, the problem with a lot of people and, and their lack of attention to this book is uh, a lot of the people uh, on the conservative uh, side of the spectrum are very, very anti-communist. And that's fine. And, you know, that's good. That's good. But their thinking is a little flawed because they say, well, let's see, if the communists are evil and bad and horrible and I oppose them, and the Nazis were opposed to the communists, well, the Nazis may not be all that bad. You know, that's their thinking. The problem with that thinking is they're both controlled by the power elite, both the communists and the Nazis, just like Bella Dodd said, the, the power elite, uh, the same people are funding both sides. But not only that, you have to understand and you have to recognize that the term Nazi means national socialist. National socialist. It's not like they're, the Nazis were wonderful, freedom-loving, independent American-type capitalists. They weren't. They were national socialists. The USSR stood for a Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Nazis stood for national socialists. They're both socialists. And so if you're really a sort of traditionalist or conservative and you don't like socialists, then not only should you not like the communists like the USSR, you should not like the Nazis either. And you got to remember, not just the communists, but the Nazis killed lots and lots and lots and lots of American patriotic soldiers. If there are communists, uh, you know, fighting Americans in Vietnam and you're killing Americans, well, the Nazis in World War II killed a lot of fine, wonderful, good, young, patriotic American uh, soldiers as well. So the point is, they're both bad. It's not the communists are bad and therefore the Nazis are good. They're both bad. And and that's think, true, but the thing is, of course, basically the same thing is true with this whole world terrorist movement. It's created by and funded by the same people who created communism, who funded Nazism, and now we have a new uh, a new terror group. It's called, uh, you know, the terrorists, and basically just as they trumped up all sorts of things uh, to tell you how terrible the Nazis were, and they were, but they will never tell you that Prescott Bush, the father of George Herbert Walker Bush and the grandfather of George W. Bush was indicted in 1942 for helping the Nazis, for certainly for subversive activities and funding the Nazis. You can find it certainly on the, your search engine. Certainly, Prescott Bush was indicted for certainly helping the Nazis in 1942. I wonder why nobody ever mentions that. Could it be that there's an organized, orchestrated effort to conceal the continuity of evil? from generation to generation to generation. We'll be back here in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And what he's saying is absolutely true. He is worth. Well, 
still Dr. Stan here at the Genesis Communication Network. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Kenny, and you certainly want to get copies of his book. Uh, uh, certainly the uh, power elite and the secret Nazi plan. Understand there is a power elite. There is a secret Nazi plan. The people at the highest levels of our government, people like Prescott Bush, indicted in 1992 for aid and certainly helping the Nazis. Uh, certainly are, are alive and well and working at the highest levels of our government today. But don't take my word for it. Check out everything that I say and that Dr. Cuddy says, and you're going to find it's true. And then we hope that you'll join us in this epic struggle. Dr. Cuddy, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, when uh, when Prescott, uh, Sheldon Bush, was uh, indicted there in uh, 1942 it's, uh, through the Union Banking uh, Corporation, it was a, a, a sort of conduit of uh, funds that would help the Nazis. And uh, as I've explained in the past, what you have is a dialectical process. So somebody like David Rockefeller, while he over the years has been working with the communists, Nelson Rockefeller is the one who was uh, working uh, with the Nazis. And the way that's all relevant today in the secret Nazi plan is coming to fulfillment today is uh, President Obama is very, very important to the paralyte in this regard because, as Dr. Stan uh, mentioned, the, the new threat, the, the terrorists, is uh, usually in, the, in some form of uh, Islamic jihad. And the reason that's important to the secret Nazi plan is that the Nazis in the 1930s had allied with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the group taking over most of these countries in the, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa today. And uh, President Obama, of course, has a Muslim background as well as he's moving our nation towards socialism as a nation. And, and I said before the break that that's what the word Nazi means. It means national socialism. So before you can have a world socialist government, you have to have each nation become socialist first. That's like the Nazi plan, national socialism. And President Obama is moving us in that direction as well as his uh, – his uh, relationship with the Muslims and his actual um, uh, his support for uh, Mohammed uh, Morsi, the head of Egypt, who was a member of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood because of that alliance that began way back in the 1930s. And so the plan is coming to fulfillment today, and that's why President Obama is re uh, important and reelected. A lot of the leading lights, uh, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, and others said there was no way he was going to be reelected, but I said uh, I believed he would would be because it was important to the fulfillment of the secret Nazi plan. Of course, uh, things are all going to fall apart within the, the next couple of years, and that's why um, uh, on the cover of my new book that's called The Power Elite, subtitled The History and Future, you'll see a picture of the coin, uh, the phoenix. It'll have the, the world phoenix. It'll be identified as that. It'll have the year 2018 on it because the, the phoenix will rise from the economic ashes that are to come in about two years or so. Things aren't going to be too bad this year, but the whole card, the house of cards, will start to collapse uh, globally uh, in a year and a half or two years so that by the final year of the Obama administration, uh, even he uh, probably would wish he hadn't run for re-election. But, you know, he's a, he's a puppet like the Bushes are puppets. Of course, that means by 2016 it'll be time for another Bush, right? You had Prescott, Sheldon Bush, Skull and Bones, his son, George H.W. Bush. Skull and Bones became president. 19 elected president in 1998, and then his son, in turn, uh, George W. Bush, Skull and Bones, was elected president in the year 2000. So 2016 will be time for the, the the next one, though, which will be uh, Jeb Bush. And so, uh, where I was talking about the uh, news reviews column series I had toward the end of it, I'm talking about this uh, article that W. J. Gannon had written in 1902. And he's talking about any individual. So what will happen to the individual under this benevolent feudalism? See, the world socialist government will be a feudalistic model. In fact, the book I had before, uh, the Secret Nazi Plan book, uh, was subtitled uh, A Techno-Feudalism. It's called New World Order and a Techno-Feudalism. It won't be the old, you know, a thousand years ago with uh, the serfs planting potatoes and so forth, but it'll be a feudal system, which means you're elite at the top, your dukes, your earls, you know, all those titled people, and then no middle class. And at the bottom, you'd have your, your basically your serfs uh, under a feudal system, you know, the, the peons, the, the, and uh, there 
there'll be a, a massive group like that today. In fact, we already have examples in China and India, and even in, in some respects, California is becoming that. You have this very, very well-to-do group, and then you have a lot of underclass, and fewer and fewer of the middle class are there. What middle class people there are have been moving out, you know, to Colorado or somewhere. And so it's becoming a feudalistic sort of structured society. Same thing in India and China. You have these very elite types, well-educated, well-off individuals at the top, but then you have a tremendously large number of uh, very, very poor people in India as well as in China, and that's uh, deliberate. That's by design so that they can compete internationally, globally, uh, for low wages. You know, you have these elite, very highly skilled, highly educated people, so you can compete at that level, uh, but then you have to have the uh, low wage uh, people. So they have a very large number of those individuals who are very poor and work for practically nothing. And I will put a, ch a chapter in uh, in my book uh, called Looming Economic uh, Disaster in the new book to come. And you'll actually see a picture of a skyscraper in Beijing where the elite would work. And then on the front lawn you see these two women sitting there on the lawn actually cutting the grass with a pair of scissors. That's uh, a great picture, a representation of the feudal system that they have in China. And they have the similar uh, in India and we're getting that way. California usually leads the nation in what's coming so we'll all become, you know, little serfs and sort of techno-feudal serfs uh, in the future. Dennis, so, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're out of time. Okay. You're on a roll, but uh, we'll continue this next week, okay? Hey, thank you. God bless, and thank you so much for doing. Our guest has been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. You want to get his books. We have all of those that are in print. Call us at 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. I specifically like his book on uh, quotations about the New World Order. But his latest book, the Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plat. Inexpensive, easy reading, and vitally important if you want to understand what is really going on. Now, let me explain to you what is going on. Basically, the Trilateral Commission controls America. If you don't believe it, I certainly get Barry Goldwater's book, and we do have used copies of Barry Goldwater's with no apologies. And on page 208, I think it is, I could be mistaken, but there, just about page 208, why he talks about the Trilateral Commission, how it's David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission, and their goal was to seize control of the economic and political control of the world by first seizing political control of the government of the United States. That's very Goldwater's words. Now, as we pointed out in the past, certainly every president and or vice president from 77 to 2008 came from the membership roles. Never more than 87 members here of the North American chapter. Certainly, when Obama came in, uh, he was not a member of the Trilateral Commission, but 11 of his key appointees were, including uh, um, General James Jones who was the National Security Advisor, the most important post. Now, General James Jones just happened to have come from the membership roles of the Trilateral Commission. He was replaced by a man named Thomas Donilon. And Thomas Donilon just happened to come from the membership roles of the Trilateral Commission. And Thomas Donilon is being relieved, and he's going to be replaced by a woman named Susan Rice. You'd never guess where she came from. You'd never guess that she, too, was a member of the Trilateral allowed to commission before she took a government job. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, it's all fraudulent. And the sooner you understand they kill people, they certainly brought down the Twin Towers. It was a controlled demolition. Watch Building 7 come down. It was a controlled demolition. Go onto the internet and watch the center of the roof begin to cave in in the middle. And then, of course, they take out the base of the building and it collapses and the walls fall in. And I actually the interview in its 4 CD set entitled, Why Did the Buildings Come Down? I interviewed the gentleman who was actually in charge of cleaning up the debris of building number seven. He got there the day after the uh, the attack, and his statement to me, and you can hear it, 99% certain it was a controlled demolition. Well, that is controlled demolition. It means they killed all those people in, in the World Trade Center, and they killed all those people in the Pentagon, and they killed the people on the plane that crashed at Shanksville. Incidentally, you can look at the way they crashed site. A big hole in the ground and no records. Now, can you explain to me how you could crash a plane into the ground nose first? and no records. 
How could that be? Well, Chris, because the records are over a field of about eight miles. And do you really think that the motors of those gigantic jet motors bounced, you know, a couple of miles away from where that hole is? Are you going to believe your lying eyes? You're going to believe what the government is going to tell you. Well, you better start believing your lying eyes. You join us in this epic struggle. Basically, you need to get the uh, so the wisdom of Malachi Martin, a four CD set, or by a Jesuit priest who tells you about the homosexuality and Satanism in the Catholic Church. You need to get the new order of the barbarians, a four CD set, and the transcript. Our number one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. One eight hundred five. Five four four eight nine two seven. If they kill those people in the twin towers, they'll kill you and your family as well. 